And our last speaker, the man of the hour, Jeremy. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you everyone for this opportunity to speak for you. I often look back on my childhood when I struggled with my disability the most. I broke bones all the time. I had, major, I had more major surgeries before the age of 10 than many of you will have in your entire lives. I occasionally went to school in a body cast. Did I have friends? Sure. But they didn't understand what I was going through. And that's not their fault. Ableist society had no interest in educating children about the experiences of disabled people. So how could I expect them to know what I was going through? I often wonder why I had to sit through gym class and watch my able-bodied friends do things I'd never be able to do. It's not that it made me sad, and I didn't feel left out exactly, but I couldn't help but wonder, why wasn't there a gym class for people like me? Didn't I need gym class too? Why did my parents have to take it upon themselves to provide a wheelchair lift for my high school stairs? Why wasn't there already a lift there? If you were to ask me, Jeremy, were you a happy child? I'd say yes, I was happy because I grew up with a loving family who encouraged me to unabashedly be myself and to not let my disability hold me back. But the truth is, I would have been happier if the rest of society had been as understanding to my needs as my family was. As a young adult, I felt very disconnected, and music became my escape from reality. I chose to ignore my disability and my limitations because thinking about it was too stressful, and I also didn't want to burden others with my woes. I just wanted to be happy and hang out, to feel like I belonged. So 18 years ago, I moved from Pennsylvania to Northampton, Massachusetts with my best friend and my bandmate so that we could pursue our musical goals. We played any and every show we could get. I crawled upstairs, crawled on bathroom floors, just so I could play a rock show. Many times I would have to hold my bladder until I got home because there was no bathroom that I could get to. Was I happy? Yes because I was surrounded by friends, playing music that I loved. Yes, it felt very dehumanizing to have to constantly be at the whim of inaccessible venues, but these traumatic feelings were suppressed so I could feel good and sane in the moment, and so that I would not ruin anyone's good times. But every now and then, I'd fly off the handle and I'd lose my temper. <coughs> Sorry, I lose my temper because I couldn't contain my frustrations. This is the struggle for many disabled people. To quote an article in Forbes by Andrew Polring from 2021, almost every disabled person who has ever called out problematic behavior or engaged in advocacy knows what it means to be labeled as angry or negative. Disabled people are especially vulnerable to this. Anger and criticism of inaccessibility, ableism, and injustice is often dismissed, not only as counterproductive, but as coming from grief and resentment of our disabilities themselves. In addition to being fundamentally wrong in most cases, branding a disabled person angry and critical and urging them to be more positive instead is an ineffective way to silence disabled people and dodge the problems we rightly complain about. Over the years, I've tried my best on a personal level in Northampton to speak up about my rights as a disabled person. Like, for instance, when Eric Seward tried to charge me $150 for the removal of a wheelchair ramp that my best friend and his father built for me just so I could get in and out of my house.
Exactly. So Eric didn't appreciate us adding something to one of his properties that would actually benefit disabled people. So he tried to char charge me money. He took away the ramp and then tried to charge me money. By the way, I never paid Eric for that ridiculous charge. I called him up and I said, no, I'm not paying for that. And he said, okay, because he knew I was right. I tried to improve the abysmal snow removal situation that occurs every winter in Northampton. I joined the Disability Commission to try to make a difference. And eventually I became the chair of the commission. Now we're gonna fast forward to three weeks ago when it was brought to my attention by a good friend that a building in Northampton where I've played countless shows with my bands throughout the years, a building that used to be accessible to people in wheelchairs was no longer accessible. They took, they took our access away completely so they could build a weed dispensary. They decided, that, they decided that the accessible door that people in wheelchairs used to use to enter the building would now be available for authorized personnel only. And they ripped the blue wheelchair symbol down off the door, doubling down on their decision to take our access away. To add insult to injury, they also built a wall over the door that used to give people in wheelchairs access to the building's elevator. That elevator could still be used by able-bodied people to get from one business to another inside that building. But there is no longer access to that elevator for people who use wheelchairs to get around because they chose profit over access, money over humanity. When I made this disturbing information available to the public, I thought I was doing that community a favor because demanding access back to that building would bring them more customers, disabled customers, and more customers needs more money, right? Yeah. Instead, the two owners accused me of attacking their businesses and trying to scare their customers away. They told their employers not to talk to me if they passed by me on the street. They encouraged hundreds of people to gang up on me and cyberbully me online. Me, a lifelong disabled person who just wanted to enter their building. Hundreds of people I've never even met were calling me evil and a bitter, angry man. They called me a liar simply for pointing out their business's inaccessibility. They called me a hypocrite posting photos from old shows that I played in that building. Photos of me smiling and enjoying life back when the building used to be accessible. Reminding me that I was once able to enter this building to have fun, and now I can't. While also reminding me that they still can, and they will. This intense, constant discrimination I experienced during this time made me feel like I was backed into a corner. And I came close to having an emotional breakdown over it. I could no longer fight this battle on my own. So I reached out to other disabled, other disabled members of our community, and we decided enough is enough. <laughs> Ableism is discrimination against people with disabilities, and it's time to flip the script. We call it disabledism the opposite of ableism. Our mission, to disable ableism wherever and whenever we see it. <laughs> this ableist language is designed to shut down ableism immediately while offering love and forgiveness. We are not here to attack or make anyone feel bad. We are simply asking our able-bodied allies to listen to us. To see, to see the struggles that we disabled people endure every single day of our lives. Share that burden with us. Share our struggle with us. We are often viewed as sad or angry in our moments of distress.
But I'd like to let you in on a little secret. We are happy people with dreams and ambitions, just like our able-bodied loved ones. Is it so wrong for us to ask to be able to go up to the bar so we can have a drink with you? No, it's not. Is it so wrong to ask for one table that is low enough for a person in a wheelchair to sit at so we can sit with you? Next time you go to a restaurant, like say the dirty truth, notice how there is not a single table inside their restaurant for a person in a wheelchair to sit at. Not a single table. We are here today to demand one table. We'll take more, but one is fine. Is it too much to ask for safer sidewalks and safer curb cuts? No. Disabled people are, are often injured on our sidewalks. This has to change. We are exhausted and tired of being treated like we are Debbie Downers just because we want to feel welcome in our city. This is our city too. We hope that the disabled movement we've started today will one day grow and branch out to other cities, other states, and maybe someday the world. But we have to start here, my friends. If we can't change our immediate surroundings, how are we supposed to change the world? Thank you. Coming up next, though, we're gonna listen to some music by uh, Philip, Philip Price and Flora Reed from the Winter Pills and Melissa Nelson on cello. Enjoy, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> 